This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers, on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio brings you relevant and detailed discussions of software engineering topics at least once a month. SE Radio is brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine, online at computer.org slash software. For Software Engineering Radio, this is Robert Blumen. Today, my guest is Chris Mickeljohn. Chris is a software engineer, distributed systems researcher, and open source contributor. He's currently a senior software engineer at Machine Zone. Prior to Machine Zone, Christopher was a senior software engineer at Basho Technologies, where he worked on the React NoSQL database. He's the author of many research publications on distributed systems and is a frequent conference speaker. He's recognized as an expert in the area of conflict-free replicated data types, which will be the subject of our show today. Chris, welcome to Software Engineering Radio. Hi, Robert. Uh, Thank you very much for having me. You're welcome. And is there anything else you'd like the listeners to know about your background before we start talking about the subject? Um, Not really, other than uh, I am starting my PhD in February in Europe uh, at a university in Belgium, the Catholic University of Louvain. And uh, I will be basically spending most of my time working on CRDTs and their application to programming languages and distributed systems and how we can build better abstractions for doing distributed programming. So, Sounds fascinating. I'd like to start out with uh, some distributed systems concepts. What does replication mean in a distributed system? So normally uh, in a distributed system, uh, replication is used to kind of provide fault tolerance and and high availability uh, of data within the system, right? So in terms of Postgres, you may have, or or MySQL or or a relational database like uh, one of those, you may, you know, have a replica that's done through a primary backup type uh, replication model where data is written to a primary source and then asynchronously replicated or sometimes synchronously replicated to another machine. And and the, this is what gives you kind of, uh, you know, the ability to fail over to the other machine, fail over to the replica when the primary goes down. There are a variety of different replication schemes that exist. Um, and it's been the topic of, you know, quite a bit of research over, over you know, the past like 20 to 30 years of distributed systems work. There's actually a a fantastic book which provides a really great overview of this from a conference that was uh, held, I think it was in 2007, a symposium in Europe that was hosted by uh, Bernadette uh, Sharon Boss. It was a 30 year kind of retrospective on all the different replication models in used in distributed systems. And uh, the proceedings are available as a Springer book. You can find it on Amazon. It's called uh, Replication, it's just the name of it. Um, and it's really fantastic because it, it looks at all these different models. So it looks at things like primary backup, and it looks at doing replication with you know quorum systems and quorum and the quorum intersection, and it looks at things like chain replication and virtual synchrony. So it kind of provides a really good overview of the kind of seminal papers in the history of replication. We'll put that in the show notes. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Now, in case of you described with Postgres primary backup. I don't see possibilities of conflicts, but how can conflicts arise in a distributed system? Yep. So the, the, so the idea is that, um, you know, if you allow, yes, with primary backup, you would say that you would only write to, you know, one of, one of the copies of the data items, right? There would be a primary source for every copy, uh, every piece of data. Um, and then you would kind of coordinate all of your rights. You would serialize and, and coordinate all of your rights through one of those replicas. But when you start looking at databases that want to provide higher availability um, and have to be able to operate when there is a network partition, um, such as, uh, to give an example, like in the primary backup situation, the primary might not be able to propagate to the backup. So you have a choice, right? So there's a few choices, actually, that you can make. So one of the choices is that if you're doing synchronous replication, you don't accept the right to the primary. The backup is unavailable. It's partitioned. 
another choice is that you asynchronously propagate. So you say, okay, the results will get sent to the backup as soon as the backup is able to be contacted. But if you want to allow readers to read from the primary and also read from the backup, uh, you have a problem where if you read from, so imagine that you're a third party and you can talk to both of the servers, but they can't talk to each other. If you make a request to the primary and read a data item, and then later make a request to the backup and attempt to read that same data item, you may see a value that existed like earlier in time, right, from, from, the, from the reader or writer's point of view. So this is a challenge about how we think about, well, how do I, you know, what kind of session guarantees do I have? How do I know, uh, you know, how do I know the guarantees that I will get reading and writing based on the replication scheme? And, you know, we, we, we refer to this idea as a consistency model. And a consistency model really is just a contract between the system and the person programming that system or programming against that system that says, you know, given these kind of, you know, given you follow these rules, you'll see these outcomes. And then we have things like strong consistency and linear realizability and weaker forms like eventual consistency. And, and these kind of explore that spectrum, explore that trade-off. Sure. So talk a bit more about eventual consistency. Sure. So, so consistency models are basically guarantees on event ordering and when events will be observed. So when updates will be delivered in the system. And uh, so eventual consistency. So if you imagine that consistency models, you know, they, they, they all have, there's a very fine, uh, diff you know, very granular differences between them. But if we kind of just imagine them on a spectrum, where some of them are almost equivalent, uh, you could imagine that on one side, at the very weak side, we have things like eventual consistency. And then on the strong side, we have things like strong consistency or linearizability or, or something like that. So eventual consistency is an extremely weak guarantee. And uh, it says that, you know, eventually, given that you ensure every update is delivered to every node in the system, uh, eventually all updates will be delivered to all nodes. And you know, they'll have some copy of the object. So it actually doesn't say anything about how you'll do the resolution of the differences on the other object. It just guarantees that eventually all of these updates will be delivered to all the nodes in the system. You have no guarantee uh, on the ordering, just that they'll get there. Okay, now I'm gonna ask you about resolution of differences. In the example you gave about conflicts, you described the situation where you write to the master and then you read from a replica, you might not see the right. But would you consider that a conflict, or does a conflict involve rights that haven't been brought into agreement? Right, right. So, so under eventual consistency, you can have you can have events arrive in. Yeah. So if we go back to the primary backup case first. Yeah. The where you would have to resolve a conflict would be if you allowed rights on both sides. So if you mm. have this model where I have two copies of a data item and I can write to either of the copies, and then they eventually synchronize with each other. In that model, uh, you could run into a conflict because you could have concurrent updates happen to the same object, um, and then they go to exchange and they don't know how to resolve, right? So you don't usually see this kind of um, behavior in systems like React, which is a Dynamo-style distributed system, things like Cassandra. You run into these problems. Um, and the fundamental idea is that it's this idea of you have concurrent you have concurrent operations that are happening on different nodes. Even if the network is totally fine, you have these concurrent operations that happen, and you have to determine which one is going to happen first, effectively, at each replica, right? So now when network partitions happen, this gets even more difficult because messages could be uh, delayed for a very, very long time. So some update comes in late, and now you have to reason about, well, where does that fit in the ordering? How do I apply this change? How do I resolve this difference, right? So, so the problems that asynchronous networks bring, like you know, with with weak ordering guarantees on messages and and possible duplication of messages. When we move to that model, these problems kind of get exacerbated, right? Because we want to have systems that are able to be online all the time and answer requests, which means that we have to take concurrent rights on either side of network partitions. And then when that system, you know, comes together again and the updates get exchanged between the two sides. How do we reason about those changes, right? How do we resolve those things? I see. So I have a distributed database with two nodes, and on one node, I write a value x equals three, and the other node, x equal, we accept a write says x equal five. At some point, then node one and node two have to agree is x three or 
five or maybe it's seven or right. so, some other value. Right, yeah. So uh, this is actually in a, in a very close to an example that I give to motivate the CRDT work is I think, yes, so we have a distributed register. We, we write one to it and then we write one, uh, we write one to replica A and two to replica B and then they exchange messages. We're kind of like, okay, without, so you, what you'd like is that the nodes independently come to what the resolution logic should be, right? So it's highly desirable to have deterministic resolution logic so that the nodes can, when they receive that update from another replica, can make a decision without having to coordinate. Um, another solution is that you have some third party, some other node or Paxos or Zookeeper or something like that sequence those operations, right? You can say, what is the actual true sequence of these operations? And then you apply them in sequencing. But that also uh, causes you to have to kind of pause and synchronize, right? You have to coordinate amongst a bunch of machines to understand which updates to take. Right? So yeah, it's a challenge of, well, how do I know which update I should take, right? And when the message could be, and you know, so one of one solution to this is that you could put physical clocks in, right? Yeah, you put physical clocks in and say, well, this update happened at a later time. But then now the challenge is, well, who specifies those clocks? How do we know those clocks won't drift, right? So now that brings a whole other set of challenges. Now we have to coordinate to synchronize clocks, right? So yeah, this is a so this is kind of this is a lot of the groundwork that leads us to to the CRDT way of thinking, I guess. What you're saying, Chris, is there's a huge design space around how conflicts get resolved. Do you replay the events in order? Last writer wins, max, min. There could be, depending on what the nature of you're trying to model, there could be many different ways of arriving at the correct result. Right. Yep, that's correct. Yeah. So, so uh, just to give two kind of concrete examples of this. Uh, the Bayou system uh, developed by Doug Terry, which I believe was at MSR at that time, uh, at Silicon Valley Research, I think. With that system, they kind of allowed the user to supply an arbitrary function. So give the server an arbitrary function that would say, okay, in the event, so the function would be a binary function that would take both objects and it would return the right object. And this function was invoked on conflict resolution. This has been seen in industry many, many times. Actually, uh, a bunch of my coworkers currently at Machine Zone uh, previously were employees of Mochi Media, uh, which was a uh, uh, kind of gaming game ad platform. And uh, one of the engineer, two of the engineers there designed a system called Statebox, which uh, basically was a CRDT before CRDTs that said for certain types, this is a resolution function. And they would use this to resolve, you know, clients that would send some conflicting states and have to resolve it, right? So. And then finally, like, you know, Amazon highlights this problem in, in the Dynamo paper. And the way they solve this problem is that they store both objects and they, they basically put the onus on the user to say, when you read this object, you might get multiple back. And when you do, uh, you have to resolve them. And they apply, a, uh, they apply a kind of primitive CRDT type resolution where they say, okay, well, if we have conflicting shopping carts, we'll union them together, right? So they, they acknowledge the fact that some items might appear after they've been deleted because they apply a set union, right? And a set union isn't going to model removals correctly or model it in a kind of monotonic way where we can reason about that. But so, you know, we've seen this numerous times, like many, many times in industry where kind of less general, maybe less principled techniques than CRDTs are used. And it, it's kind of all the, a, a lot of this work was kind of uh, people researching the problems that observed in these real systems. And some of it was just industry trying to solve it the, the best way that they could uh, at the same time that academia was investigating it. And we kind of came to similar solutions at the same time. Now we're almost moving into talking about CRDTs. So let's, let's do that. What is a CRDT? So um, the CRDT name actually is interesting because it's had a multiple, multiple different uh, kind of, um, you know, answers to what the acronym stands for. But currently it's known as a conflict-free replicated data type. But previously, um, this was kind of a generalization of two different design spaces that were kind of came together. So there was one group in Portugal uh, and another group in uh, France collaborating with a, a different university in Portugal, actually. And uh, one of these groups was focusing on commutative operations and the other group was focusing on kind of convergent data structures, right? So the CRDT kind of name, commutative and convergent, 
is kind of an umbrella term that's for these these two approaches, two very different approaches. They're similar, but they're, they require different system models and things like that. But two approaches to building data types that are designed to be replicated. So it assumes they will be replicated and they will be operated on concurrently. And they have deterministic resolution under conflicts. So it, it guarantees that any separate states can kind of always be merged really is kind of the simplification. So we can have concurrent actors and they can be doing different things. And then we have these nodes kind of synchronize and resolve the difference. Okay. In our earlier discussion, we were talking about a replicated value like X and it's resolved. What is a replicated data type? I don't think there's really kind of a definition of a replicated data type. I, I think that when I think of a replicated data type, I think of basically any any data type that is replicated across a bunch of machines, right? That That is effectively a replicated data type, but I don't think that there's really a formal definition for, for what we mean by this. Um, I guess it's just kind of first class in the name because these are data types that are designed for uses in replication scenarios, if that makes sense. I see. So it could be any well-known data type, a simple type like int or set or map or list or you name it, and that data type is replicated within a distributed system. Sure, yeah. So so some data types, so we could say, you know, so some, so it's interesting, right? Because usually as a programmer who's like, you know, writing code on my machine, uh, I'm working with sequential data types, right? So I'm using, or, or sometimes I'm using concurrent data types, right? You might be using concurrent collections in Java or something like that. But normally you program with a sequential data type. So I would program with a sequential set. Um, and with a sequential set, you can't actually make a replicated version that converges that matches the semantics of a sequential set. Because the sequential set doesn't have the idea that you can have con uh, concurrent actors modifying, doing operations on this data structure, and having concurrent operations that might conflict. Like we don't normally have this, right? If we do have a sequential set on a machine, we have two choices if we want to have. So if this is a language where I have you know, thread concurrency or process concurrency, like Erlang or something, if I have some set and uh, that's in shared memory and actors are going to uh, multiple, uh, are all going to act on it doing removals and additions, I either have to lock to get determinism or I have to, or, or I just deal with inherent non-determinism, right? Because I may have somebody concurrently add and remove a set, and then you know we have to synchronize on on what might win or something like that, right? Mm. So usually, what we have to do is when we when we model these sequential data types in a distributed fashion, and we know that some node might be unavailable for a long time. So let's consider the case where we have a set, and I add an element to it, and you add an element to it, and then we get partitioned. And then I remove the element, and maybe you add it, you remove it, and then re-add it, and then now we converge. So now we have to really kind of scratch our heads and say, all right, so what should that, what, what should actually win here, right? Like when I did my removal, was I removing the element that I saw observed in the set? But then you removed it, but then you re-added it, right? So does your re-add override my remove, or does your add get removed by my remove right so now when it comes back together we're like wow well okay this is really hard so how, how do we actually model this in a way where somebody can actually really build a, a computer program that uses a database for instance that has this behavior right so now building applications gets really really hard when things like this kind of stand in our way and we say okay well, well how can i reason about this how do i know what the update will be right okay i think you define the problem very clearly we have this set and it's replicated on different nodes, updates may arrive not all at the same node, but different nodes. And they may uh, at least apparently be in the conflict with each other. The system has to resolve the updates that occurred concurrently in different places and arrive at a single value. And that's maybe impossible to do in such a way as it would give you the same result as a set that existed in a single memory space. Did I get that? That's correct, yes. So you've explained that the problem cannot be solved in a general way that gives you a distributed system that behaves like a sequential system. How do CRDTs 
solve this problem in a useful way? Yeah, so, so CRDTs basically attempt to model in various ways, depending on the type of CRDT, but they attempt to model all of the operations that have happened. And then they kind of have, they have a merge function that is kind of a priori decision on how concurrent conflicting operations would be handled. So to give a concrete example, uh, if we go back to the case where we had that situation where you've added a few times and removed the same element and I've added and removed the same element a bunch of times, when we go to exchange our data, we have to decide how, if that value that we were both adding and removing a bunch of times without being in communication with each other, whether that will be in the set or not. And so with the CRDT-based sets that allow removals and additions, like for arbitrary elements an arbitrary number of times, um, there's two types of sets. There's basically two design, design possibilities. And one is a remove bias version or an add bias version. So we have to say that you know if there's an element that's in the set, uh, and then we get partitioned, and you add and remove it maybe, and then I add it, or and then I concurrently add it or remove it. We have to decide decide ahead of time. Well, we always want to bias towards additions, or we always want to bias towards removals. Um, only when there are concurrent uh, conflicting updates. So um, the more popular design choice for sets in practice is is kind of an add wins set. Uh, because the add wins set closely uh, kind of, if you look at the actual design of it, kind of mimics the behavior of a set where you can't actually issue removal operations until you've seen an element in the set and you only can remove things that you've actually seen. So so this one kind of gets us as close as possible to a sequential set and probably the one of the easier sets to think about or the one of the easier design choices uh, to think about in terms of a programmer. But, you know, fundamentally... You know, we have to think about concurrency because the concurrency is inherent in the system. Otherwise, we wouldn't be using these data types, right? All right. You mentioned we have to agree ahead of time on how we're going to resolve these updates. Say a bit more about the importance of a deterministic method of resolving conflicts in making these mm -hmm. CRDTs useful. Yeah, so uh, if we want... So if we imagine a system where we have five nodes and the updates, the operations for, let's say, a distributed set uh, are delivered in arbitrary order, right? So every node can see these in different order, and we can well assume that you know some messages might be replayed. So in a situation like this, uh, having a deterministic function allows each node independently to arrive at the exact same result given these operations, right? So we want we want to have a function that is deterministic regardless of the ordering replay or delays or any of this stuff. We say as soon as the same set of updates have been delivered to all of the nodes, they'll independently arrive at the exact same value. This is a really a, 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 a required and necessary property to have because otherwise, uh, if I have three replicas and I deliver the events in a different order and my function is non-deterministic, uh, I could end up with replica A having a different value than replica B. And now that's a real big problem, right? Because now mm -hmm. I've uh, now I have no way about reasoning which of those changes are correct, and I'm back to the original problem that we were trying to solve. Would it be more accurate to call these things conflict resolving data types rather than conflict free? Well, I guess the idea is that they attempt to avoid conflicts, right? Um, every object is always mergeable, so we don't really consider any objects in conflict with each other. Okay. Fair enough. Now, uh, I'm aware from studying this before the interview, there are two main types, the operation-based and the state-based. Could you explain what, what those are, mm -hmm. how they're different? Yep. Uh, so with the two main types, and this is what I was saying before, the difference between commutative and convergent uh, replicated data types, and there's, a, there's kind of a research report by INRIA uh, is considered the canonical resource. It's uh, from 2011. It's about, I don't know, it, it maybe somewhere between 50 and 100 pages, maybe. It's, it's very large. And this outlines the design of several data types uh, in an operation-based fashion and a state-based fashion. And then it shows that uh, these two types are equivalent and fulfill a property known as strong eventual consistency. So before I explain the two types, I'll quickly explain what strong eventual consistency is. So strong eventual consistency is an eventually consistent model with a strong convergence property. 
And what this means is that uh, under a normal eventual consistency, we say that all the updates will eventually be, served by, uh, be observed by all nodes in the system. But we actually don't guarantee that uh, we won't generate conflicts uh, at the nodes given different delivery orderings. So what CRDTs say is that uh, once all of the updates are delivered, so so in in eventual consistency, a perfectly valid thing to do would say you would say, well, replica A received six updates. Uh, they're all out of order, um, and we don't use some ordering, th uh, some system for ordering like vector clocks or something. So they all come out of order, and I don't know which one to take, so I store all of them and I just punt use it reconciliation to the user. That is a perfectly valid thing to do for eventual consistency. So what strong eventual consistency says is that when all of these updates are delivered, given that all of the updates are be able to be merged with each other, and we're kind of avoiding conflicts in the system, uh, that we'll just have a value. And that value will be the same on all the nodes. So we guarantee strong convergence, where we generate no conflicts. But we actually make no guarantees on when those updates will be visible in the system. So, so, so stronger consistency models also make kind of a recency guarantee that will say, well, if you write this object, you know, and then you go to read it, you'll be able to read it immediately. And, and they make various uh, guarantees like that. So we say, we don't know when these updates might be observed in the system. It's up to the system to deliver all the updates. But once all of those updates are delivered, regardless of ordering a replay, we guarantee that all copies of a data item, a replicated data item, will be the same, will have the same value. Um, and that's based on this deterministic merge function. So uh, there are kind of two different ways of doing this. So uh, operations-based is a way where you try to model these data types as all commutative operations. And for some of these things, you actually need a causal delivery channel, which means that you're going to, uh, some of the updates actually have to be delivered in order. And the other type is state-based. So operation-based are more efficient because you can send less state between nodes. You can just send the kind of deltas, these update operations. Uh, where state-based model the entire data item as this mathematical structure known as a, uh, a join semilattice, a bounded join semilattice. Um, and state-based require you sending the entire state um, around. So uh, if we have a set and that it's like a grow only set, a set where we only can add elements, we actually have to send that whole data structure, send the state, the entire set around all the time. However, the state-based ones require less delivery guarantees. Let's talk about some of the more well-known CRDTs. And I think that will help uh, people understand what they are useful for. Let's start out with counters. Uh -huh. So, um, yep, so I, I'll explain uh, these in terms of the state-based implementations. Um, so, uh, w and because it's, it's interesting to see how these things kind of build on top of each other and we, and we can implement other ones in terms of, of others. So, uh, there's an increment-only counter, which is referred to as a G counter. So a grow only counter. What a G counter does is it allows actors to uh, increment only. And this requires us to uniquely identify every actor in the system so that we know. So we say that each copy of this, each, each copy of, so we imagine this counter as a set of, of pairs. And it will be a pair of the actor and the number of times it's performed an increment. And then we sum uh, all of those counts to get the value of the counter. So in this case, uh, if you, Robert, were to in increment the counter, your copy of the counter, you increment the Robert uh, entry, the Robert pair in that set by one. And then I would increment the Christopher pair uh, by one. And then when we share our state, what we do is we just union those two sets together. And if we have any, uh, uh, if we have any pairs that exist with the same name uh, between the two sets, we take the pairwise kind of maximum of, of those counts. And uh, this, is, this is monotonic, so we know that the count can only ever grow, so we can use max, and we know that the set will only get bigger with the number of actors, uh, so we union the set. And this is what defines a CRDT-based increment-only counter. So if, if we're to think of, well, well, I'd like to be able to decrement that counter. <laughs> uh, now we have to think about, okay, well, we need to model decrements in a way that's monotonic, because if we remove, if we start saying, well, Christopher can lower his count, then how do I know um, the difference between somebody who has seen the uh, undecremented counter 
so how do I tell the difference between an un a, a incremented and decremented counter versus a counter that hasn't observed any of those events or has observed maybe only one of those events, right? So the idea is that the, counter... the problem there being if I have a three and you have a five, the three might be ahead of the five if there were some decrements. That's exactly that right. Had applied yes. The, the idea is that the three and the five if the number can move in both directions, don't allow us to know whether you've seen events uh, and move past them or haven't seen them at all. Okay, but if, if it was a grow only, the five is by definition ahead of the three and you go with the five. That's correct. Yes, okay, so there is some, uh, go so ahead. There are some very specific uh, constraints to make that true. So one of the invariants that's required to make that true is that actors can only modify their position in, in the set. So uh, if I can increment the Robert entry and you can increment the Robert entry, well, now we don't know that the five, you know, seeing a five and a six, I don't know if uh, that five maybe has one in it that, you know, didn't you didn't see yet, but maybe I saw or something, right? So our five, if we both can concurrently modify the same entry in the vector, uh, that five is not safe by itself. We need more information. Sure. So there's an invariant we only can modify our own uh, entries. Um, so the way that we do this with a, to get a, a positive negative counter, or PN counter, is we just keep two of these sets. Uh, and we keep, a gr basically, a PN counter is kind of the you know, product of two G counters, right? Where a G counter represents increments, and we have another G counter that represents decrements, right? So now both of these counters continuously grow up. So if you have incremented and decremented the counter, then you've incremented the positive counter, and you've incremented the negative counter, and then we take the difference of these two counters to determine the true value of the counter. Great. Um, now you mentioned sets before, grow only set. What are some of the conflict-free replicated sets? Right, so uh, we can think of a, so a grow only set is basically able to be modeled as just a set. You know, a set where we don't allow removals. And then it's very straightforward to compute the merge function uh, for that. It's just the set union. So, um, however, when we try to have a set where we can remove things, the set, it becomes more difficult. And we run into the same problem we have with the counter, is that how do I model removals? Um, so there's something called a two-piece set, a two-phase set. And uh, the two-phase set basically does a similar model. It, mod it uses two sets um, to track additions and removals. However, it places an interesting invariant on use of the data structure that says once something has been added and removed, it can never be re-added because I've only modeled a single addition and a single removal by tracking a grow, like kind of a, an addition set, and then what we refer to as a tombstone set. So the tombstone set says that these are the values in the addition set that shouldn't be part of the actual like user observable value of the data structure. Um, so if we're continuing from there, we say, okay, well, what if we want to set where we can do arbitrary additions and removals of the same element? And this is what we have um, that's referred to as the observed remove set. Um, and what this set does is it uses a unique identifier generated by the actor performing the operation. So some ID that's globally unique, or it really only has to be unique for this one data structure, but it, you know, for the whole object, it has to be unique. And we track a set of the unique additions, and then we track a set kind of of the unique removals. So when you go to remove a bunch of elements from the set, you say, okay, I observed these additions. Um, so these are the additions that I am allowed to remove. And you just kind of migrate the entries from one set into another through a set union. And what this set does is this is add biased. So if we go back to the, um, the example we had in the beginning, if I am, uh, if so we have some OR set and it's, uh, you have a copy, you have one replica and I have a replica. If we both simultaneously, or concurrently rather, um, add X to the set, I will add X with unique identifier one and you'll add X with unique identifier two. So now if I go to remove X, I only can remove the X of unique identifier one. Um, because it's the only X addition that I've seen. I've only observed that, so I only can remove that. So then when we go to merge, we union these sets, and now you have unique identifier one being added and removed by me, and then unique identifier two being added by you. And so now when I go to see what elements are in this set, 
I can kind of take the difference of the unique identifiers, and then those are the elements, and then it's a set, so any of the repeated ones are just a single presence in the set. So then I know what's in the set. So this is biased towards additions winning under concurrent operations. I'm, I'm following how the CRDTs are able to solve the problem of conflict resolution by keeping more state and more history. So that is good. It, it sounds like they come at some cost in terms of space and growing over time. Is that correct? Yep. So uh, garbage collection is a problem. With this uh, OR set, you can see that just given the design we've talked through over the phone, that the space complexity is on the number of operations performed. So every addition, every removal has to be tracked. Um, so that's a really big problem in practice. Um, so there's some work that was originally done for the for the operation-based style OR set and then further expanded by two colleagues of mine, or three colleagues of mine, at, uh, former colleagues at Bachelor Technologies, uh, specifically Russell Brown, Sean Cribbs, and Sam Elliott, who uh, worked on kind of bringing this OR SWAT into practice, um, which is the Observe Remove set without tombstones. And the way this set works is that it uses a vector. So this is very similar to the a dotted version vector set, which has uh, existed kind of in the causality world uh, that's kind of used in the CRDT world now to model this. And, and what it does is it uses a vector, so a, a set of actor count pairs, similar to a vector clock, where it models uh, kind of a causal time of where all updates have been seen so it can remove tombstones that kind of uh, have existed earlier than that time. This is kind of a generalization of how the model works. It, it, actually, it actually works by tracking a, a specific element for each addition and then removal and then incrementing a vector to match that element by storing uh, something that relates the vector to the item. And then when uh, the item is dropped, the vector doesn't advance. So uh, having a vector, so if you actually end up seeing an element and if you know, if you end up seeing the same vector with an element matching that vector, and then you see the vector by itself, the vector by itself without the element shows you that you've observed the addition, and now the element has been removed. So this allows us to create less garbage, right? Because because the challenge of doing the garbage collections on the CRDTs without coordination is really hard. And some of the previous approaches have said, well, you use strong, you know, you'll do a garbage collection every so often synchronized to do it. So this allows us to reduce the amount of garbage we create, uh, therefore requiring less garbage collection. <laughs> I'd like to uh, move in a bit of a different direction here and talk about what are some of the more popular use cases for CRDTs in what type of domains? Sure, yeah. So um, I can speak to uh, a few of these. So uh, in the React distributed database that Basho provides, the, the colleagues that I mentioned before uh, worked very hard to create a open source CRDT implementation referred to as React DT, uh, which is in Erlang. So they provide a API from React that allows you to work with counters, uh, sets, dictionaries, which are kind of recursive uh, data types that can contain other CRDTs and also dictionaries themselves, as well as Boolean kind of flags so CRDT flags that move in one direction or the other, so false, true, true, or true to false. And finally, um, registers and a bunch of different types of registers. So uh, yeah, that's a general open source, uh, open source high, uh, available, like highly available dynamo, dynamo style database that, that you can download and use that exposes all this stuff. Chris, what are some applications and how are people using CRDTs in their application? Yep. Um, so Bet365 uh, has used it, uh, has used the set for tracking um, information within their, their, uh, their large gambling provider in the United Kingdom. So they, they track some internal state with using the OR SWAT so they can do concurrent modifications and not have to worry about conflicts uh, being generated and handle partitions. Riot Games has built uh, a bunch of their chat functionality for League of Legends on top of uh, CRDTs uh, with React as well. They actually don't use the implementation in React as far as I know, but they've, they've actually built CRDTs and they just store them in React as normal objects. And, and finally, I mean, there's a variety of people that are using it for, you know, just they're using the highly available counters. SoundCloud is actually using the set as well for 
uh, modeling. They have an open source system called uh, Roshi, which uh, they use for generating timelines. So their timeline, when you log into SoundCloud and you see all of like the artists who have posted songs. So uh, it's used in a variety of, of, of applications where high, high availability is required. I don't know if this is what Riot Games is doing, but I could see a multi-person chat being a set where the members of the set are the comments that different people have contributed to the chat and you want everybody to eventually arrive at the same chat history. Is, is that the right direction? To uh, think about I, it? I don't actually remember offhand. Uh, they do have a strange loop talk where they talk about, uh, they talk about how they've built the entire system, like the, ch the chat system and scaled it. But I, I don't specifically remember uh, exactly which data they were using CRD. Okay. We'll put that in the show notes. Another example that you've mentioned a couple of times is shopping cart. How and why would a CRDT be a good choice for a shopping cart? Mm -hmm. So uh, in, in one of the original papers, uh, the, the idea CRDTs and strong eventual consistency was the Dynamo example from, uh, of the shopping cart where you have the concurrent additions and removals, and then you union the shopping cart, which is modeled as a set, and you see anomalies where items come back. And this is specifically called out by the authors of the Dynamo paper. So in, in one of the CRDT papers, I don't remember which one, but one of the earlier uh, INRIA ones, this design of this observe remove set where you only can remove the things that you've seen added um, specifically is designed to address that problem highlighted in the Amazon paper. And they, they make a call out to say this kind of effectively solves you know, the Am Amazon's problem of having these items recur and like reappear under concurrent modifications. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of that work and a lot of the a lot of the design decisions and kind of acknowledgments of these concurrency anomalies, as they're called uh, in, in industry literature, has uh, directly influenced the design of a lot of the CRDT work. Oh, actually, I I'd like to bring up one other use case as well. Um, as part of the Sync Free Research Group, which is um, an EU-funded research project that Basho is a member of, and um, there's a bunch of universities, a lot of the universities that were involved in the original CRDT research, one of the major industry partners for that research project is, Ro is Rovio Entertainment, uh, the maker of Angry Birds. So a lot of the use cases that we've currently been doing research on, like the design of a CRDT-based leaderboard, like a top K style leaderboard um, on the devices, as well as a eventually consistent advertisement counter that's built using CRDTs. A lot of these use cases are coming directly from uh, Rovio Entertainment. So um, there's quite a bit, the research project's nice because we get to work on, on actual real problems, uh, you know, that, that are being solved with synchronization kind of in practice. And, you know, the, these companies want to reduce synchronization in their systems. So it's really nice to kind of have that synergy with industry. It's great to know that Angry Birds is driving innovation in database technology. Yeah, for sure. Rovio is a, uh, is a very big user of React, actually. And uh, yeah, they're, they're very interested in having us look at, look at these problems. Um, so they, they've posed at least three to four, I think it's three or four use cases of application designs they'd like to see. Um, and a lot of my PhD work is kind of, uh, we, we have some research that we've done on preliminary designs for these things. So I'm hoping that within you know the next year or so, we'll continue to be able to make the designs even better uh, over time as we, as we have it available. I wanna talk a little bit more about the shopping cart. As I understand the problem, it's mainly about availability where there are multiple copies of the shopping cart on Amazon's network, and it may not be feasible to always update or always read the same one because the node might have gone away or be unavailable. So you want the shopping experience to be uninterrupted to allow people to add to other copies of the cart, and hopefully that will be seamless. That's correct. Yep. This is reminding me in early days of Amazon, I would sometimes put something in my cart. It would take a very long time to reload the page, like 30 seconds, and it would come back and my shopping cart was empty. So that's a bad experience. Right. Yep. So in the in the Dynamo paper, um, so there's a few interesting kind of design points here. Uh, in the Dynamo paper, they specifically call out that they did some study, and I forget the exact numbers, but I think they said a 50 second increase in latency 
or 500 millisecond increase in latency resulted in some very large percentage of, of abandoned purchases. So, so Amazon ran some internal study where they quantified how much money they lost by having certain operations have higher latency. And this is especially bad during the Christmas shopping season where uh, their system would, under very high load, be unavailable. So what Amazon w did was they wanted to have putting items into the shopping cart be extremely highly available. So they, they weakened the consistency requirements. They replicated the data items a number of times, uh, and they would kind of write to replicas or groups of replicas. But and trying to get over sections, like use a quorum intersection technique where you ensure you kind of try to overlap each request, even if you contact different nodes by a couple nodes or a single node to ensure that uh, you kind of see your rights. But sometimes under failure conditions and partitions, you can't guarantee this. So Amazon wanted to make inserting items into the cart be as highly available as possible. But they said, well, once you get into the cart and you go to checkout, we can do that like with a strongly consistent system, right? So they say, say we want weak consistency adding items to the cart. And then when you go to checkout, because we have to like process credit cards and do all this stuff, uh, you know, it's fine to coordinate there. And, you know, the observation is that if you go to put something into your cart, like kind of once you've got it into your cart and you hit the checkout button, you've kind of mentally committed at that point where, uh, you know, if you go to click add to cart and it takes like two seconds, you'll just go to a different website, right? Or, or go buy it in the store or something, right? So so they were trying to solve this from a revenue perspective. And that that's kind of what motivated a lot of these design decisions. Sure. And then based on how that use case might do resolution. There are conceivable scenarios where I added something to my cart, I removed it, and then I see it back in the cart again. Yep. Yeah. So this would be a case where, you know, if I, if I contact some group of nodes and make some update, and then there's some failure or something, and I happen to co contact a different group of nodes to service a request, and then I may see some earlier state because of asynchronous propagation when there are failures happening in the network or partitions. Okay. A little bit ago, you were talking about the React implementation of CRDTs. These are clearly, from your description, very technical and complex technologies with high uh, degree of difficulty to implement correctly. Do you see them being provided more in terms of libraries or inherent functions that a server like React knows how to perform and all the user needs to know is to know enough to use them correctly. Yeah, so the idea is to make it is to use these things as easy as possible because uh, they are extremely difficult to implement. One of my colleagues, Russell, uh, spent some time with QuickCheck verifying uh, the Basho implementation of these data items and found some extremely pathological interleavings of operations that invalidated kind of the merge functions for some of our initial designs, especially when working on the observer moveset in the map. They're observer moveset without tombstones in the map. And, uh, you know, we, we worked with a variety of people to kind of debug these issues and figure out what the right semantics we thought for these data structures should be. So, so implementing these things is really hard. Um, and tools like QuickCheck get you very much farther than you would ever get with uh, normal unit testing, and then really trying to use model checking, especially if you're coming up with new designs of CRDTs, at least formally proving uh, or informally proving through mathematics or, or a, a proof assistant, verifying you have the implementation correct. Because if there's even a slight bug, once you deploy it and those systems are out in the, you know, especially if you put all these items in the database, uh, you know, and you find a bug, upgrading is a hard thing. Because <laughs> they're data structures that are designed to, you know, be partitioned for a long time and eventually come back and send their state. And, you know, upgrading sometimes requires uh, a very principled approach to versioning of your data structures or uh, coordinating to get machines to, you know, kind of update those data structures. Because even having one of them floating around in the system can propagate itself, basically, and it reintroduce the bug. So, so debugging and implementing these things is hard. In terms of React, the interface that's provided, uh, the client actually, so the React clients uh, provide, try to provide a very similar interface to the language they're implemented in, uh, which is really nice. So if you happen to use the Java client that Basho provides, 
something like a set will implement like the enumerable interface uh, from Java or iterable. So you can, I forget, I'm not a, I'm not a Java programmer, but I, I am pretty sure there's a iterable interface. And uh, so you can, you can interact with these things using a lot of the normal uh, functions from the host language or methods from like the hosting language. So that's really nice. So you kind of get to work with a set like it's a set. And you get to work with a register like it's a register, and work, and a boolean can be used in any function that takes a boolean. So that's that's a, that's really nice, and that that kind of reduces the burden of having to know all of the special things about the CRDP data types, right? Sure. But I mean, that's just working with React, right? That's a nice thing that React does. You know, it's up to the author or the implementer of you know whatever the library is in whatever language it is how well that interface kind of matches with it so so i think that uh you know crdts are are still hard to program with we still actually don't know the right way to build applications that are built all with crdts uh, i think crdts are currently stuck in a place where you think about single objects and having this dictionary uh this this react map dictionary uh structure that allows you to nest crdts get you a little bit closer to co composition, right? Because you can compose CRDTs together, but it doesn't get you to the place where you actually can build computer programs that is ma that, that are made up of all CRDTs, right? So, so it sounds like, Christopher, you're leading up to a discussion of a programming language you're involved in that supports CRDTs at the language level. Tell us about that. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so uh, we are, uh, as part of the Syncree research work, one of the tasks, one of the work packages of this EU-funded group, uh, this EU-funded research project, is to look into programming abstractions with CRDTs. Uh, and so this is the this is kind of the uh, work that uh, I've been doing over the past year, and uh, work that I'll be continuing on my PhD uh, with uh, a group at the Catholic University of Leuven under Peter Van Roy. And there's a a bunch of my colleagues are also in this group, and. So we're kind of trying to take a look at, all right, so we have CRDTs and this is great. And so how do we program with them now, right? How do we enable composition? How do we al allow us to build programs where all of the data types are CRDTs? How can we do things like, you know, as a functional programmer, how can we, uh, you know, like take a CRDT and fold it into a different type of CRDT or, or map a CRDT set? And the whole idea is to kind of say, can we make building like eventually consistent applications better? Can we make programs that can be replicated themselves? And those programs themselves uh, are tolerant to reordering and replay. And they can operate under network partitions and have all of the nice properties. Can we extend all of the properties that CRDTs have to programs that are built using only CRDTs? So uh, the programming language, so we have this uh, programming model called LASP, uh, which stands for Lattice Processing obviously inspired by the, the naming of Lisp. Um, and, and the reason for this is because the base data structure in this language is, the, is a state-based CRDT. So it's, it's one of these state-based that are modeled as a bounded join semi-lattice. And uh, what we're trying to do is enable uh, a functional programming abstraction on top of CRDTs. We want to keep all of these kind of, we want to map these really strong properties that you get from functional programming, such as referential transparency and confluence, we want to kind of map that into this world because these properties are really nice. This is what makes functional programming really nice, is to have these properties. It sounds fascinating, and perhaps uh, we're a few years away from that having an impact on industry and programmers' general knowledge, but sounds like a great research project. We're getting close to the end of our time. If people would like to learn more about your work, where can they find you? Yeah, so um, uh, I have a blog where I um, kind of just keep, uh, you know, periodically post about different application designs that we're building with our with uh, our programming language LASP. And uh, in addition to that, uh, you know, I'm on Twitter and I, I talk about distributed systems and CRDT related things there. And uh, the, the webpage for uh, our programming model, which has a link to a bunch of conference videos and papers and uh, the actual implementation in Erlang, so the prototype implementation, uh, is at lasp-lang.org. You can put that in the show notes as well. Great. Uh, Christopher Mickeljohn, thank you very much for speaking to Software Engineering Radio. Thank you very much for having me.
Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more information about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can write comments on each episode on the website or write a review on iTunes. Mention or message us on Twitter, at SE Radio, or search for the Software Engineering Radio Group on LinkedIn, Google+, or Facebook. You can also email us at team at se-radio.net. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under the Creative Commons 2.5 license. Thanks again for your support. Thank you.